I'm fairly certain that um, everything I'm going to say to you in the, the last 15 minutes of your day, you've already heard or you already know. Um, so if you'll just indulge me for a little bit, and um, let's pretend that I'm Alex Trebek, and um, your contestants on America's TV beloved game show, Jeopardy. So as you know, in Jeopardy, we always have categories. So the first category is going to be medical treatments for a thousand. So numerous studies have shown this treatment to improve your cholesterol, reduce your blood pressure, control your weight, improve your muscle strength, improve your energy level and circulation, prevent stroke, improve your bone health, and boost your immune system. This treatment has also been shown to prevent DVT and PE, improve your self-image, improve sleep, improve your quality of life, help you maintain independence, decrease stress, relieve anxiety, and treat depression. So audience, think about your answer. That's right. What is exercise? See, you knew. I told you. Um, so that being said, uh, not only do you know this, but Hippocrates knew this 2,500 years ago. And now we have a full body of research that supports the benefits of exercise. In fact, we now understand that it's not only important to exercise, but we can't sit for too long in between either. In a 12-year study of postmenopausal women enrolled in the Women's Health Initiative, those who sat for more than 10 hours a day had an 18% higher risk for heart attack and stroke than those who sat less than five hours. And there was another study of um, 63 Australian men, and those that sat for more than four hours a day were more likely to have heart disease and diabetes than those who sat for less than four hours a day, regardless of how active they were otherwise. And there was a Canadian study of both men and women and that found that those who sat for most of the day were 54% more likely to die over the next 11 years than those who sat less than half that time. So we know that exercise improves all of the major risk factors for cardiovascular disease and stroke. When you're talking about weight and hypertension, we, we know that exercise has an impact. Um, there's about 75 million Americans with um, hypertension, and many of those, as we've seen, are untreated or they are not taking their medication. But um, exercise can improve that. And um, in one study, it was in the Archives of Internal Medicine, there was a 16-point improvement in blood sugar, excuse me, in blood pressure among patients who were on the DASH diet who also participated in an exercise program. And we see this in the cardiac rehab center all the time. Patients are always amazed when they come in and they exercise, and then afterwards their blood pressures are much better. So it's really um, empowering when you actually see those numbers come down. Um, we know that there's an estimated 32 million adults who have elevated uh, cholesterol profiles, and as you've seen in all the presentations already today, um, exercise will decrease your total, your LDL and your triglycerides, and it boosts your HDL, and that's the good cholesterol, so that goes through your bloodstream and acts like a scavenger to pull the LDL back to the liver for reprocessing. And for each one mil milligram per deciliter increase in HDL, you get a, a, a good bang for your buck. It reduces coronary risk by 2 to 3 percent. We've already talked and seen the slides about the um, obesity epidemic, and we know that uh, a healthy uh, program of exercise helps to control weight and help you lose weight. Um, diabetes can, considered the evil twin uh, of heart disease. Um, being active and fit reduces your chances of developing type 2 diabetes. In patients that were pre-diabetic and they exercised and were in a, a vigorous exercise program, they redu reduced the risk of moving into frank diabetes by 58 percent. Exercise is also a great way uh, to help with your daily glycemic control if you have diabetes. And again, uh, it's something that we find our patients have an amazing response when they exercise and they see their blood pressure come down. It's, it's very uh, empowering. 
Exercise has also been shown to boost mood, improve mental wellness, relieve tension and anxiety, and um, anger as well. Uh, walking uh, regularly even can help the aging brain against memory loss and dementia. Um, low to moderate uh, intensity exercise sustained over time is actually thought now to help nerve cells in the brain's hippocampus grow and make new connections, which can help relieve symptoms of depression. So in some patients suffering from depression, exercise has been shown to be as effective as antidepressant medications. And I, though, I know that that's not what we're talking about today, but these are just some of the extra benefits of exercise. So how is it that we know that it's important for the dog to walk, but we don't recognize that it's important for ourselves? Um, American Heart Association statistics tell us that only 21% of adults meet the federal guidelines for physical activity. And in children, in high school children, grades 9 to 12, only 28% meet those recommendations. So what's your excuse? <laughs> These are some of the things that I hear in um, the cardiac rehab program. I hate exercise. <laughs> They come in, they sit down, and we talk, and they say, I hate exercise. I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, I don't sweat unless I'm getting paid. <laughs> That's my favorite. I don't have time, or it's too boring. It's too hot. It's too cold. It's too late. I'm too old. I'm too tired. I'll start tomorrow. Sound like anybody? Um, we're, we have very busy lives. We're doing lots of things you know, we're shuffling our children around, we're working sometimes two or three jobs, we are going to school, we have many outside commitments, and sometimes it's very hard to fit in exercise in your day. So we'll talk today about some ideas that I have and that um, have been shown to help improve um, getting exercise worked into your lifestyle and talk about how to do that. Because those who think they don't have time for exercise will have to find time for illness. So here's some good advice. To prevent a heart attack, take one aspirin a day, take it out for a jog, then take it to the gym, and then take it for a bike ride. <laughs> so how do you start? Well, the first thing you should do is choose an activity that you really like to do. You're going to have a much better chance continuing with that if it's something that you enjoy. So when patients tell me I hate exercise, I start to ask them, what kind of activities do you like to do? Um, start slowly, add a few minutes to your routine each week. Just like as uh, Kathy told us with food, you can't make all the changes at once, but just pick one thing and start with that. Avoid that all or nothing thinking. I have to eat everything correctly or I have to exercise five days a week. You can just take one, one step at a time, um, even if it's just five minutes to start. So how do you know if you're exercising the right way? Well, we think of um, this little acronym FIT, Frequency, Intensity, and Time. So you all know now from all of the presentations that the recommendation is for 150 minutes a week, which would be 30 minutes, five days a week. Um, we like to see that uh, you're doing at least 30 minutes. Um, if you have diabetes, you should be exercising every day and definitely no more than two days a week without exercise. Um, you can learn to monitor your heart rate by checking your pulse. And in the um, cardiac rehab program, we do six-minute walk tests and stress tests. You might want to consult with your doctor and see if that's necessary for you to have to get you, you know, more specific guidelines. But um, you can always, you know, get started on a walking program. Um, Usually we use 65 to 85% of someone's peak heart rate on their stress test, but that's again modified because patients are often on medications that will uh, affect their heart rate and um, blood pressure. But one of the things you can do is use what we call this perceived exertion scale. It's the Borg scale. And we tell patients, we want you to be working fairly light to somewhat hard. And I apologize for the typo up there. Um, but you should be doing a moderate effort. So if you're walking, for instance, or cycling, you should be able to talk, and you should be able to have a conversation and feel like you're working moderately hard, but not so much that you can't carry on a conversation. However, if you're singing, you're not working hard enough. 30 to 60 minutes continuously for each session. Um, no less than 20 minutes of that should be in that training range that you determine. You want to do at least 150 minutes a week, as we mentioned. And for real weight loss and long-term weight control, you're going to have to increase that to maybe 200 to 300 minutes a week. So when's the best time to exercise? 
The best time is when you can regularly fit it into your schedule. Doesn't matter if it's day or night, it's best to find the time that works for you. Start um, exercise slowly. Over the first five minutes, you want to warm up. So you're going to gradually increase your heart rate when you do this. You're going to uh, tell your heart that you're going to be doing more work, so it's going to get the idea that you have to increase your rate. It's going to increase the blood flow to your muscles. You loosen your muscles and joints when you warm up, and you reduce the likelihood of developing an arrhythmia or cardiac ischemia. Same thing is true at the other end of your exercise. The cool down is just as important. And even when we get patients that come to cardiac rehab who are exercisers, it's often uh, a mystery to me that they don't understand the concepts of warm up and cool down. So we spend a lot of time explaining that you really do need to cool down at the end and help your body temperature cool down. Um, you start to clear the lactic acid from your muscles. It gradually decreases your heart rate um, and reduces the chance of ischemia arrhythmias. After you've exercised, your blood vessels are dilated, so oftentimes you'll get a drop in your blood pressure, so you want to make sure that you're hydrated while you're exercising, and um, again, do that nice slow cool down at the end to avoid that drop. Um, you know what time your meetings are. You know what time you have to pick up your son at school. You know, you know just about what time your meals are. So schedule your exercise too. Put it in your calendar so that you know what time of day exercise is. And you'll, again, have a much better chance of achieving that if you know and it's scheduled into your day. Um, we talked about starting off slowly and pacing yourself. Be realistic about your goals. Uh, we sit down and, and write goals with each patient that come to cardiac rehab. And it's important that you be realistic. What, what will fit into your day? Don't, you know, decide that you're gonna, you know, join a health club if it's 45 minutes away and not on your way home from work. Logs are helpful. Um, if you um, have something written down that you can see across the week, what you've done, it's, it's often, again, empowering that you're on track. Some people like to wake up early because they feel like they just can't fit it into their day, and that's great if, if you, you know, that works for you. But again, it, you know, for me, it wouldn't work because I can't get up any earlier than I already do. Um, take the stairs every day. You know, forget there's an elevator in your building. Park farther away from um, the stores when you go shopping. Um, start Walmart. Uh, wa excuse me, mall walking if that's convenient and close to you. Um, we always encourage patients to get a buddy because you're much more likely to keep an appointment with someone than you are with a treadmill. Try for home video equipment. A lot of the gaming um, systems at home have all kinds of aerobic workouts on them that you might find fun if that's more convenient. Um, watch less TV from your couch. <laughs> Stand up, move around. Um, if you, um, you know, sort of hide your remote control so you actually have to change the channel by getting up and walking across the room. That would help just to get your activity and just to get you moving. Um, not everyone can work at a, um, a stand-up desk with a, a treadmill, but you can at least periodically during the day stand up, maybe make it a point of when you pick up the phone to make phone calls that you stand up and have your phone calls while you're standing and, and move your legs around. Just moving around as much as you can during the day. Um, when I first uh, did a slide like this and put uh, get a dog and take him for a walk, I didn't have a dog. But now after having a, year, uh, a dog for a year, I can tell you, you do have to get the dog out and get him for a walk. So it, it does um, help increase your activity. You might want to try walking at lunch. Some some co companies have like lunch buddies and then you, you know, spend half of your time at uh, lunchtime walking and that's always helpful. Maybe I'm going to start with a question because I've got something I have to get off my chest. So I saw my PCP last year and uh, he asked me, what do you do for exercise? And I said, well, I play tennis three or four times a week, um, singles tennis. Um, I sweat a lot. It's, it's a great workout. And he said, that's, that's not exercise. You're spending a lot of time like standing around. That's, that's not really exercise. You need to be running or on elliptical. Is there any truth to what he said or... Um, I mean, I'm drenched when I'm done. I, I would say no. I think what you're doing is exercise. It's absolutely exercise, and that's great exercise. Um, I think the thought was that it, you had to do, be doing like 30 minutes of sustained 
you know, exercise with a, in your peak heart rate range. And now I, I, I think that we don't feel that way anymore. If you're doing an, an activity like playing tennis, you're getting your heart rate up enough to um, have benefit. Isn't there a sort of emerging, an emerging line of thinking that start, start and stop type exercise is also very good for We, we are starting to do fitness. more interval, interval training now. Yes, there is more evidence coming across. And, and just moving, just keeping moving. I mean, we thought that just doing that 30 minutes a day was enough, and now we realize that you can't do 30 minutes a day and sit at the computer for 10 other hours, you know? Yes, sir. Um, if someone is genuinely very busy uh, and they're elderly, and they also have a problem with their feet. Uh, how do you uh, encourage that person to exercise and what kind of exercise uh, would be good for them? Um, there, are, there are pieces of equipment that you can do recumbent, you know, that you can sit and, and your feet are sort of planted on pedals that mm -hmm. you can use. So there's, there's pr would, probably an exercise for just about everyone. Would, would the exercise bike uh, be a good it, it might be if they don't have problems with their knees or even right. if they do but they can be evaluated to make sure that that would exercise right. would be okay for them and how to how to convince them that it's in their best interest to do this every day <laughs> <laughs> well I hope I did so today I mean there's plenty of evidence out there um, <laughs> other questions yes sir I try to exercise two or three times a week on an, on an exercise bike and a treadmill. And every once in a while it gets to me in my knees, so I have to quit for two or three days. And the foot doctor that I have as a result of my diabetic condition tells me that I should go and get a new pair of sneakers with a high back, and because the damage to your foot when you're riding on that treadmill affects your knees and in turn affects your back. And as a result of that, he says you ought to go and buy these sneakers. Now, I don't know if he was trying to sell sneakers or, <laughs> he, or he had something worthwhile for me to go chasing and buy a pair of new sneakers with, with a high back and lace-up shoes. And my wife says the only time I wear lace, the only reason I wear lace, no lace shoes is I'm too lazy to get down to tie them. Well, bend, bending and moving to tie them is also, you know, good flexibility. So it's probably a good idea. But I'm not an expert on shoes or orthopedic um, injuries, but um, I know that, you know, walking on treadmills, you know, can have an effect on your back. So sometimes, you know, we have a, a physical therapy department that works with us in, in cardiac rehab, and, and those physical therapists will often um, evaluate patients and, and help them choose which exercises are best. But Proper footwear does make a difference, and it is really important. I, I know even just for myself this summer when I was walking the dog with flip-flops, I was having a lot more pain in my legs and back than when I, you know, put my sneakers back on. So um, footwear does make a, a big impact on, on pain on your joints and muscles when you're exercising. So getting good footwear generally helps. What your specific issues are, you know, I can't speak to, but um, I, I'm sure a physical therapist could also help you determine, um, you know, what, which path to go as far as sneakers. Any other questions? Everybody wants to go home? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You. That was wonderful.